Patty Kate. Going Patty Kate now over Zoom. It's great. So, Raging Bull is the latest film Noah and I will be covering here on the AFI's Top 100. A movie I went in just expecting your average boxing flick. This is the first movie I actually haven't seen before that we're covering here on the challenge, as I've started calling it, the AFI challenge, for clicks and engagement. <laughs> and this was pretty much the polar opposite of what I expected it to be. I was expecting the glorious rise and downfall of a boxing champion, and instead we got a deep dive into an abusive sociopath who might be the most insecure character I have ever seen in a movie. Noah, what did you think of Raging Bull, the boxing movie that that allowed boxing to fall to the background and focused on abuse. Well, I think that's kind of, it's not, it's a boxing movie that is not in any way really about boxing. Um, it's about a man who deals with serious jealousy and insecurity and takes it out in the form of uh, like psychosis and yeah. abuse, physical and verbal. I, I, genuinely hate him like he is i use so much abuse that i've seen in my own life and just the worst people he has their characteristics and martin scorsese made sure to walk this character through pretty much the entire gambit of abusive behaviors where he is hitting women and people who are not trained fighters like he is he's verbally assaulting gaslighting manipulating just everything he can possibly do to make everyone else feel as shitty as he does the movie. <laughs> oh, it's terrible. He, hold on, I, I gotta kind of get my head right for this for a minute. Um, oh, I get it. It's not a fun movie to talk about. No, and I'm like, in looking back at it and having read reviews on it and doing my absolute best to sort of tackle this movie from a an objective standpoint. There are things that the movie does exceptionally well, and I think oh, yeah. one of them is that you feel so viscerally upset with this character and just watching it. Um, Emily, like Emily, had to leave the room; she couldn't finish watching the movie. Um, and I think just the fact that you feel so upset at who the main character of this film is speaks to the fact that Robert De Niro and Scorsese did an excellent job of sort of portraying this person's life. Um, all that said, it doesn't make it any easier a film that's any easier to watch. Yeah, it really it, like the entire movie to me just felt like someone who is dealing with serious sexual insecurity, um, even from the very beginning where he's talking about his tiny hands. And he says, like, you know what they say about tiny hands and all that this whole sort of thing. I feel like the rest of the movie, I'm just like, that's how I'm watching it is putting in the frame of a guy who's just incredibly insecure. And they never sort of come out and say, like, what or if there is anything and credit to scorsese and the incredible performance behind jake lamada the name of the character this is about a real life man uh because they do go through an arc of trying to make you feel bad for him and i don't think the movie actually wanted you to though it was almost like the movie was flexing because the movie was like yeah now he's dealing with the consequences of his actions but you hate him so much you're kind of just like good and it's rare to find a movie that's presenting the main character dealing with all this horrible stuff but it's all just reaping what they sowed so you're kind of just like yeah fuck you like there's a scene spoiler alert we do spoiler deep dives here where he is breaking down in a jail cell yeah. smashing his head against the wall punching the walls just unable to process the emotions he's dealing with the lowest point for him and the entire time i'm watching him i'm just like good i, <laughs> like, like, I hate you i violently hate it you it felt like you know that was such a that was such a good scene to watch in so many ways because because you're finally you get this satisfaction of yes like you are reaping you reaped what you sowed you know but you, i started off watching that scene and i felt like Oh my gosh, you know, he's dealing with so much, like finally everything is uh is coming back around on him. Um, and as I continued to watch the scene, it it like he devolves into what is more of um like a temper tantrum. Yeah. You know, it's it felt way more like a child having a, a temper tantrum than a grown man sort of coming to terms with the consequences of his actions. Um, and that's why he never grows. He yes. doesn't actually come to terms with shit. Yeah, he never does. He he watches himself. You know, you see this sort of steady decline from you know being the middleweight champion of the world to um, doing his best to host like at strip clubs, um, being the MC for strip clubs and nightclubs, various things that he owns, and sort of you know going into debt. His wife leaves him. All of this stuff. 
Um, and he never, there's no sort of um, coming to terms with himself. No. Then they make it clear even after his wife leaves him, he's still treating her like shit. There's no like remorseful, oh, he's actually coming back and being apologetic. He goes into her house and breaks a bunch of her stuff and is like, it's yes. your fault and leaves. Like, it's like, oh my God. Why did you put the dishes away and so that they don't fall down? And you're like, you're, you're banging a hammer against the table. Yeah. Um, and so to credit to this movie though, because it doesn't, it still keeps a very human view of Jake where it doesn't just purely take away from a lot of the pressure he was still under. It doesn't use that stuff as an excuse, but it also still conveys this guy's dealing with body dysmorphia. This mm -hmm. guy's dealing with clearly undiagnosed mental health problems, but tactfully it never says, so this other stuff is okay. It just has two very clear messages of yes, he's fucked up, but he's also fucking people up and that's not okay. very much so and i um just because it is even though it's not really a movie about boxing it's still there's a lot of you know the main character is in fact a boxer and so we do have plenty of boxing scenes in the movie and so i wanted to tie a little bit one thing that i did think was really interesting about the film was that uh jake's sort of mental state prior to every boxing match kind of guides how the boxing match is going to go the one scene that I think paints that sort of portrait incredibly clearly is uh, when his wife Vicky is talking about what's his name. The very pretty boxer. Yeah, yeah the very pretty a boxer boxer's known and like, for how beautiful he is. He has a pretty, yeah, she says he has a pretty face and Jake like latches on to those two words and just will not drop it. You know, wh why do you say he's got a pretty face? What do you mean by that? What, you know, what is he, do you know him? Have you met the guy? Like, do you, are you into him? Do you want to fuck him? Like all this stuff. And his wife's just like, it's just what I fucking heard. I mean, like, he's just like, I've what never I've heard. seen him. I've literally never seen him. It's just what people say about him. And he goes into the ring and he knows he's going to win. And he just, and he beats the shit out of this guy. And when the guy goes down, one of the commentators, as if to like, as if you needed sort of any more like proof of what was going on, the guy says, well, he doesn't have a pretty face anymore. And that, that does fall into a lack of subtlety this movie has in sure. some angles, but this is one of the few times where I actually feel like that's very appropriate. When you're dealing with someone who's on the mental level of what Jake LaMotta is being portrayed as, I always want to make that distinction. I don't know the guy in real life. He seems like he's a bad dude, but you know, there's also, as no one was going to get into later, there's lawsuits about this movie. Mm. Um, but you know, if, if even 1% of the stuff is covered, I mean, we do know for sure the guy was a pedophile. Um, 14, he was arrested yeah. for going after children, uh, and he doesn't cope with that, doesn't say it was my fault. He keeps saying, like, oh, the girl said it's 21. Well, she's 14. <laughs> she's 14-year-old. The DA comes in and is like, you know this girl? She's 14. And he and he looks at the DA agents, and he, there's no sort of, you know, I'm sorry. Oh, I had no idea. There's no sort of uh, attempt at him trying to, you know, even just feel any kind of, like, a little bit of remorse uh, and he looks at the DA agents and he says something like, you look at this girl, you tell me she looks like she's 14. And you're like, that's, that's not, that's, that's not, not really the point <laughs> here. Um. And that's, it's, it's such a psychological movie, which I think is heavily reflected, as you said, not only in his mental state and how it reflects in the boxing matches, but how the boxing matches are shot as totally. well. There's this very surrealist approach to certain shots and how there's like, the ring is too wide for it to possibly be in certain angles. And they do these like dramatic zoom ins and there's this smoke. And even just the way like Sugar Ray Robinson, who he notoriously had a rivalry with, yes. is like hitting him at times. It's not meant to feel like a real fight. Yeah. It almost feels like a nightmare. Yeah, definitely. Um, which adds up to Lamada's own world. I mean, he makes everyone near him feel like they're living a nightmare all the time. That's yes, very well said, Daniel. I totally agree. And I think, um, if nothing else, one of the things that this film really has going for it is the visual sort of uh, stunningness of it all. Scorsese actually used a variety of different sized boxing rings that he built for the movie, so that uh, to sort of reflect where Jake is at that point in the movie or at that point in his career. So when he's, you know, the first time you see him fighting Sugar Ray Robinson, the, the boxing ring looks huge. And that's kind of to reflect how Jake feels like, you know, he's center stage and everyone's there for him. And, you know, he's like, he is the main guy. He's the one who everyone's rooting for. And then by the time you get to the last fight with Sugar Ray, um, it's incredibly claustrophobic. You have a very, a much smaller ring yeah. and there's all these close up shots of him and Sugar Ray to sort of make it feel like a much tighter space. And they used, and they used a much smaller ring for it too. 
And I will say as a boxing fan, this is a total, not really a criticism of the movie side note. Sugar Ray Robinson's one of my favorite fighters. Yeah. And so I was actually really hoping this movie would get into their rivalry and oh, Sugar no. Ray and stuff like that. Not at all. <laughs> like they, they, they show the fights, but you, like they don't mention him much outside the ring. Yeah. It's not a motivating factor. The focus, as it should be, is just on his psychosis. And that's actually, I do like Martin Scorsese a lot as a sure. director. Who doesn't? He's a master of his craft. But he doesn't always walk that line of not glorifying things he shouldn't. Yeah. And Raging Bull, as soon as I realized what it was going to be, I was really afraid that he was going to not walk that line properly. But in my subjective opinion, this is his best display of understanding that his main character is the villain. That's really interesting. Uh, more so than Taxi Driver, more, which I think he did a really good job there too. Definitely more so than Wolf of Wall Street, which he did try to critique that, but that movie does still, in my opinion, glorify too much. Um, this though, it felt like Martin Scorsese had a personal gripe with his main character. Yeah. Um, he was just ruthless and relentless in how low he made him sink, um, which is why Noah's going to get into this now. Here's your cue, Noah. Ba -dum -bum -boop. Um, uh, the brother character named uh, Joey, Joey yeah. sued in real life uh, for his portrayal. And uh, Jake Blanda's portrayal as well. Can you know it's here? just Joey? And, you know, so there's several interesting things to go into here. First of all, the guy who wrote the movie or who helped write the movie, uh, I believe his name is Peter Schrader. Um, and it's based off of. Jake LaMotta's memoir called Jake LaMotta, Raging Bull, or Raging Bull, you know, True Life Story or something. So it's based off of a book. And, that Jake um, LaMotta wrote? Yes. Or, you know, he wrote or he had someone write for him. Co-wrote. Yeah, Ghost exactly. Wrote. Joey's not even in the memoir. Like, Peter Schrader had to go around talking to people and getting firsthand accounts to figure out that Jake had a brother. That's how sort of, that's how uh, destroyed that relationship was. Wow. Um, and so, you know, they do all this research and they they find Jake's brother and, and that's how they sort of craft the character. You know, he was originally supposed to have just a right-hand man who was just his friend. And then they find out that he has a brother. Um, and they turn that character into his brother. Okay, and so there is some liberties taken in that angle. Except for the fact that, you know, this this movie doesn't really deal with noble characters. No. Nope. But between the two of them, Joey is the more level headed guy who tries to tries to sort of reason with Jake. It may be my favorite Joe Pesci performance. Yeah. I've seen Goodfellas, I've seen my cousin Vinny, but he absolutely nailed the dealing with an abusive brother. Oh, he's perfect. It is the exact you know, he almost got out of acting before before this wow. movie. Yeah, he he was a B-movie actor and Robert De Niro had seen him in the last project that he did. And when De Niro is trying to get Scorsese to, to do this movie, he's like, I think I really think you should have uh, Joe, Pesci, Joe Pesci come on and do an audition. And so, right, which is incredibly fortunate because then we get a bunch of other fantastic performances from Pesci. Um, but this is sort of the one that actually puts him on the map and makes him more, like highlights him more. I think he won a Best Supporting Actor for this. Have you heard Joe Pesci's rap album? Because that's a real oh, thing. Oh, God, yes. Oh, my God, yes. You, ben, what? our wonderful editor, put in three seconds now. Hey, hey, out my ass, treat all my Boom. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I don't know what... I, I don't know how you get to that point. I don't know. We could do a whole episode on Joe Pesci's rap album. Let's just not do that. <laughs> we could do a whole podcast on Joe Pesci. And his rap album, and his rapping career. But going Do you want to, to scrap the AFI thing altogether? The AFI is <laughs> just if this is now just the Joe Pesci podcast. Uh, well, getting into the actual respectable side of uh, Joe Pesci's artistic endeavors, <laughs> there is a cautious air about Joe Pesci when he's dealing with his brother, and a hesitation, and this overwhelming calmness that he tries to radiate out to cool his brother off. And it just felt so real. It yeah. felt so right to me how he was hitting that to the point where Joe Pesci, in my opinion, either had to deal with that in real life or he worked with people who had because it was just nail on the head. Yeah. And I actually, I do think Robert De Niro's performance is great, but I don't think it's the hardest performance to do. And I actually am more enamored by uh, Vicky's performance and yeah. Joe Pesci's, um, or Joey, I think is his name, because uh, that's to me a more... Uh, well-rounded performance. Well, Robert De Niro, what he's doing is very impressive. He's really just having to hit like two notes because that's yeah, all this definitely. guy had. Manic, angry, 
and building up to manic angry. Like there's just a <laughs> switch for him. Yeah, that he it's, goes just, on. it's just operating in a constant state of paranoia, right? Yeah. That's the whole. That's the whole thing, and then letting the paranoia take over. And um, but I, talk I about, told, go ahead. No, go ahead. I was gonna say, can we talk about the ending of the movie? Because I really want to talk about the ending of the movie. It's my. It's maybe the perfect ending for this kind of movie. I really want to talk about the end of the movie. I just wanted to agree with you for a moment about. Uh, so I know the actress. I, God, I feel so bad when I can't remember people's names. It's totally. Give me one second here. I'll pull it up. Yeah. Kathy Moriarty. She has a Moriarty, Moriarty last name. That's cool. What a great last name. <laughs> Holy crap. She definitely, she did win best supporting actress for this movie. I know, or both best supporting actor. But she should have. Um, no, but their performance, she was like, she was 19 when she played the role. And so for her to sort of, same thing with uh, what you were saying about Joe Pesci having like either knowing people who went through those kind of relationships or having had a relationship like that himself, um, the kind of performance that he gives is very similar to um, Kathy Moriarty's just in so far as for a 19 year old woman to be playing the role of someone who's going through an abusive relationship yeah. and going through the various stages of marriage, you know, being married to an abusive boxer for 11 years, having kids at the age of 20, like all this stuff. Um, I, a hundred percent believe there was never a point during the movie where I was like, Oh, that's kind of a, you know, hackneyed performance or whatever, or a yeah, performance. It, She's fantastic. I wish a little bit more spotlight had been given to her character arc as well. Mm. Cause she has a fabulous one of first being a minor that this predator is preying on. And then yeah. by the end of their marriage, she's, telling him off, getting him out of her life. And it's actually a really like, oh my God, this woman's badass by the end of it. And yeah, just being no like, shit. you're a professional boxer, but fuck you, get out of my life. I kind of thought that about for the entire movie there. So uh, that the way that she shot in so many scenes, it feels like she's more imposing than Jake. Jake is always kind of slouched over something. He's always slouched over a TV or his like belly sticking out, except for when he's maybe in the ring. Mm -hmm. Um, there are so many scenes where Vicky's walking around and she has this like tall, straight posture and these broad shoulders. She's very sort of composed and um, um, I don't know, sure of herself so often where Jake is kind of the opposite, you know? So I, I completely agree. And I think that's part of the reason that she was able to maintain even the bit of control in the relationship she did. Mm -hmm. uh, she very much so was someone who... Yes, he was obviously as a boxer, someone who was physically more imposing, but she didn't give him an inch that he didn't have to yeah. take. And I, that was kind of a very admirable part of her character. Um, you know, I don't want to get into the heavy psychology I'm underqualified to talk about for abusive sure. relationships like that. But at least from an outside novice perspective, there was a strength in her that was like, you're braver than I would be. Oh, um, yeah. Hell yeah. I would be cowed by that guy in a second. Are you kidding me? He comes off like a firework that's been lit. Um, but getting into getting hitting that note, once that firework has gone off to the point where it's burned every bridge around them, the ending of this movie is an out of shape, uh, just total hack at this point. Uh, Jake LaMotta. 60 pounds overweight. Super. Um, and he's finally hit that weight he talked about. Uh, not to fat <laughs> shame, but he just has. Um, and he, he just ran into his brother. And that has caused him in the dressing room to just start monologuing into the mirror about how everything that went wrong in his life is his brother's fault and it's not his yeah and it is the most pathetic thing where you're looking at this guy and you're just like you're a worm like you can't take you cannot take responsibility for anything and you are so up your own ass even at rock bottom that yeah. you're trying to blame your brother who at every turn was looking is trying out to help you. you out it's just like it's just trying to do his best for you but um, so, so that is that's one of my favorite scenes in the movie, hands down. I think it's, it's the it's, only way that you could have ended this movie and had it land on the note it should have. It was beautiful. Well, so you know, it's from it's from a, a previous movie. It's from On the Waterfront. He's oh, wow. he's quoting, um, which is actually which is the boxing movie that I'm really looking forward to watching. Um, first of all, I have not seen Raging Bull. This is my first first time watching it. Same. Um, but the scene that or the the monologue that Robert De Niro recites at the end is a famous, famous monologue from On the Waterfront, also about a, a boxer. Um, it's Marlon Brando playing Terry Malloy, who's another real life character. And at the very end of the movie, um, Marlon Brando gives that monologue to his brother. And so the interesting thing there is that like, in my personal opinion, is that Terry Malloy, who's played by Marlon Brando, really has been exploited by his brother. He really has been, he's this oh guy who God. 
really has had a lot going for him and was a good person is just trying to like make it as a boxer and his brother is this kind of two bit con who is you know looking for the short end money looking for you know looking for him to his brother to throw fights um and so you have this uh, what i feel is a very intentional kind of juxtaposition between oh yeah Jake LaMotta, who absolutely deserves what, you know, everything that came to him and none of it really is the fault of his brother, but he's giving this monologue as though it is. Whereas the person who originally gave that monologue is absolutely someone who is at rock bottom through mostly no fault of his own, you know? Good Lord. This movie, it's, I hated watching it, but I respect the hell out of it. Like, it, I, so actually let's get to that. Let's get to this part. Do you recommend Raging Bull? Would you recommend this to someone? To the right person, it's. I mean, <laughs> I, 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 I don't know. I kind of wanted to talk. I, it's like it's one of my dad's favorite films, and I, I have yet to sort of talk to him about that, um, because I kind of want to get his take on it. Because watching this for the first time, you know, I, it, it would be very difficult for me to be like, wow, that was, you know, that was an incredible movie, and it was. We've obviously we've said a lot of incredible things about it, but I wouldn't, you know, reflect on that. And, you know, keep it up there and have it as one of my, you know, all time favorite movies to return to. Um, and this is number four yeah. on the AFI top 100. This is like in the, within the top five films. I would not have it nearly that high. I think answering the question we're going to get to, I would keep it in my top 100 mm. with a massive asterisk that it's probably one of the few movies in my top 100 I've not recommend to a lot of people. Yeah. Um, I would recommend this to people who really want to complete their film catalog of seeing all these different totally. great films. Uh, but for anyone who has experienced abuse, I think this could be highly triggering Absolutely. and it's, it's just not a mass audience movie. I mean, you feel that and Scorsese occasionally does do mass audience stuff and then he'll mm -hmm. do taxi driver and then he'll do raging bull. Um, and that kind of it, like, taxi driver is also another movie where I've shown it to a few people and yeah. like some of them are like, that was amazing. And some of them are like, I will never recommend, take a recommendation from you yeah, again. Totally. Taxi driver is another really difficult movie to watch. Yeah. Um, and I, I think that there's a theme for Scorsese that runs through a lot of his movies and even the three that you listed, right? So you have Raging Bull, Taxi Driver, and Wolf of Wall Street all deal with this sort of theme of uh, like masculine insecurity. And, yeah. and even with like specifically with Raging Bull and Taxi Driver, it's uh, this sort of idolization of this blonde woman of just like a woman who's sort of put on a pedestal by the main character, um, but not for the right reasons, you know? And well, Wolf of Wall Street too. Same thing. Yeah. yeah. Wolf of Wall Street as well. So I, you know, I, I don't know enough about Scorsese personally to know if there's, if there's sort of a reflection of that, of any sort of personal experiences in the movies that he directs and, and produces and writes. Um, but it, I just, you know, I was watching it and sort of thought that was an interesting thing. Yeah. To note. And I also would point out that in Taxi Driver and Raging Bull, there's also an obsession with a minor. Um, yeah. which comes through. I don't believe there's that in Wolf of Wall Street, but that's because they're, they're, those are true story. You can't just add that about Jordan Belfort if he didn't do that. I don't know yeah. if Jordan Belfort did. I've not looked into that person because that person doesn't interest me. Um, I've seen enough. Uh, but so uh, would you keep Raging Bull on your AFI top 100? Honestly, no. Um, okay. And not because I, not because I don't think it's a great film. Honestly, something that is, interesting and maybe important to watch for people who want a character study of what abusive relationships and what psychosis looks like and the forms that it can take because there are things about this that the movie does exceptionally well in fact i think um you know the fact that it makes you feel so viscerally unwell watching it speaks to the quality of the movie in that way yeah um but as far as something you know there's like, I think there's four boxing, different boxing movies on the AFI top 100. And that's kind of a lot. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but I wouldn't keep it on the AFI top 100. And if I did, it would be number 99 or 100. Um, there are qualities about it that I think make it good that would stay on here. But I totally see and respect why. For me, though, I love a movie that makes me think, that makes me take mm -hmm. away something. And my God, did Raging Bull do that? It was as I said, violently uncomfortable. I did not have a good time. I wouldn't even say I was entertained, but in terms of making me think and yeah. feel masterclass. Uh, yeah. And so that's why, why it's going to stay. I would even say like probably, again, I have a lot of movies to watch that I haven't seen on this list, but for me right now, like probably safely in the fifties. Wow. Um, yeah. Yeah. 
Uh, and I just also, it might be, I think, Martin Scorsese's most impressive movie for me as well. Which is, again, saying something. That guy is a film catalog. Consistently, Raging Bull, I think, is almost regularly rated as his uh, most impressive or, or, you know, top top movie that he's done. And that is a very nice transition into the question, do you think it should be remade today? Oh. Uh, yeah, that's a hard one. That's a really hard one. Do you want me to go first? Yeah, sure, go ahead. Let me, let me think about it for a second. What do you think, Daniel? Because Scorsese is still around, if he signed on for some reason to do a remake with maybe a, an actor I slightly like more than Robert De Niro, unpopular opinion, I just don't love him as much as everyone else does. I still like him. He's okay. <laughs> He's fine. <laughs> um, if there was an actor I could buy a bit more in this role, I could theoretically, but it's right on that line and I'm gonna fall into just don't because this feels so meticulously crafted. I don't know if Scorsese has the energy to, to be that meticulous again. So I'm just gonna say yeah. no. Yeah, definitely. I think, well, so I think one of the things that um, might change my personal opinion for this question is um, is to not have Scorsese do this movie if there were a remake of really? it. And yeah, well, so we've been talking so much about representation on the AFI, you know, and the fact that so many of them are directed by white men, the fact that most of them feature protagonists who are white straight men, um, you know, and the fact that Scorsese does so many movies from that sort of perspective of someone who is suspicious of um, women and who has like a, you know, a, a prominent woman in the movie as, as someone to sort of be revered and also like suspicious and cruel towards. Um, it, the only thing that I would kind of want to see retold is, you know, like we were saying earlier, maybe more of Vicky's perspective or, yeah. you know, a movie that, that sort of, sort of shows, um, the trials and tribulations, but then the eventual, um, you know, successful rise of someone leaving an abusive relationship, you know, yeah. and I don't really know, I, I'm not a film director, I'm not a film writer, so I really, I don't know how you would write that film or how you would do it, um, and I don't know how you would make it, um, like, a appealing, you know, because that's such a tough sort of plot yeah. to pitch, um, but that's what I would see. I think that's a wonderful idea, but I would say that's a different movie. Yeah. <laughs> I would say if you're shifting the main character, I'd say that's not Raging Bull anymore, and I would love to see that movie. You're absolutely right. Yeah. Grab a female director, make it sure it's definitely from a female view, and absolutely tell her story. As we've co covered here, it's amazing what she went through and had to put up with. Yeah. But that just wouldn't be remaking Raging Bull. No, that's, a fair, yeah, that's a fair point. So, uh, I, no, I guess is a short <laughs> All right. Well, that's our, I think we're a little bit briefer here, but no offense. No, I don't like talking about an abusive asshole for that long. Is that fair to say, Noah? <laughs> yeah, I think so. All right. Uh, well, thank you so much, everyone, for tuning on in. Let us know what you think of Raging Bull in the comments down below and what movie we should get to next. Uh, Noah, any final thoughts? Uh, yeah, my camera stopped recording seven minutes ago. Great. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, everyone, for tuning in. Have a good one. Bye. Thank you. Wait, who am I waving to? I, there's nothing. No one's recording. There's nothing recording. I don't know who you just waved at either.